Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, so, uh, can you see me all right? Because uh, I'm a short person, so I wanted to make sure that you see me. Uh, okay, uh, let me start by introducing myself. My name is Rebecca. Uh, I'm from Recife, Brazil. We have a lot of people from Brazil here. Uh, it's a little place with a lot of sun, a lot of beaches, a lot of ocean, so I recommend to you. Uh, I graduated in, the, in computer engineer by the University of Pernambuco. And I work on Vinta software and we have some coffee. So we don't want to bring the coffee back, so please go get the coffee. Uh, we work mainly with Pile and we are like a software studio from Brazil. A few things before we start, uh, I love football. And my home team now is going to be playing for the finals uh, of the Brazilian third division. Yeah, third. We suck, but I love them. So I'm not going to be able to be there because I'm here. So I'm gonna, I, I want to wish all the luck and love and bring this title home, boys. So let's start. I try to be funny on the title, but I will be talking about data anonymization. Okay. I hope you all understood, but we're going to be talking about anonymization. So Jane Doe is the name. Uh, also, uh, we have a link uh, for the talk. You can follow up anytime that you want. And that's it. Uh, Jane Doe is a name that we mostly use when we don't know the person's name, but we just want to call the person something. And anonymization is way beyond just replacing names. Uh, one example is the Netflix price issue. Who knows this, this issue? OK, not many people, right. So Netflix in 2009, they released a data set with like 10 million records with some information about movie ratings. And their main goal was to like have a better recommendation system. So people got this data set, and they just, let's see if we can find who these persons are in the Netflix data set. And they were able to link a Netflix data set with the IMDb data set. So if a person had four ratings on the IMDb data set, they could be uniquely identified. And this just caused a few problems for Netflix, and they went through a few lawsuits, and it was like a problem. Another example is in this picture, we have a, a map of a military base of the US in Afghanistan. We should not see this, you know? But soldiers, when they are in the field, they like to run. I don't know if you know that, but they run a lot. And they use fitness trackers. So this data of this fitness tracker, they went online. They just published, but the data is anonymized because we don't have information about users, but we have information about location. And this is a secret location. And you might be thinking, wait, is anonymization even possible? Because there's a lot of people saying that it isn't, and a lot of articles saying that you're not safe. But in this talk, I wanted to show you that it is possible, uh, of course, with a few like, exceptions. But in the general one, it's possible. And I want to show you this with uh, all examples that I can show you. Here's an outline of the talk. I'm going to be talking about a little bit about regulations, then pseudonymization, then anonymization. Let's start. Uh, anonymization is a, is a thing that, was, that has been studied for a while now for a lot of different fields. And all of this uh, just uh, lead to regulations. And we have uh, the biggest regulation uh, in, uh, OK. It's general data protection that is for European citizens. And this regulation has a lot of uh, exceptions and has a lot of rules they have to follow and has a lot of rights to the data subject. But the main idea that this regulation has for you is privacy by design. So that if you're thinking about releasing data from your users, if you're thinking about uh, building a product, you think about the privacy of the person first. The first technique that this regulation uh, talks about is pseudonymization. It's a technique for you to protect the customer's data. And 
Pseudonymization is still considered personal data, but you just like uh, kind of hide the information in a different manner. So you have a few techniques to do pseudonymization. The first one is data masking, approximation, encryption, and tokenization. And we use this on a day to day. We use this a lot, and we might not even notice. One example is when you have a Django project, you, you, you build models to just store all the attributes of your entities. And you have username, first name, last name, and emails. But you don't use this personal information to your system. When you want to build relationships with other models, you just link these models with a unique identifier. So that's right there a type of anonymization because you just link the models with abstractions. Another example is how Stripe deals with payments. They do not just deal with all your credit card information and your security token, your security code. They build a token and they use a token to charge you. Although all your personal information might be easily found, they just deal with the abstraction. There's a really great talk about pseudonymization that was from Django Con last year. I totally recommend. Uh, there's a lot of puns and Phil Collins. The guy loves Phil Collins, me too. So check it out. Let's get into what matters today, that is anonymization. And we want to build something that will not reveal anything about our customers. We want to reveal something that is like, can't potentially identify persons. And we are now, will be held accountable by the GDPR. We have a few approaches to anonymization, if you want to think in approaches. And we can do first a static anonymization. We can do it dynamically, or you can just not anonymize anything. You're going to just build a synthetic data set that just have a similar distribution to real data. So we are not going to be talking about synthetic data today, because it, it will be a really long talk, and I don't have that time. But we're going to be talking about static and dynamic anonymization. When we first uh, think about applying these this techniques on Vinta, we deal with a static anonymization method. So what we did was we get, uh, we destructively alter uh, a database and to just build a fake data set for us to test. So we wanted to have local and staging environments that was just have the same type of data as production. And this was the first thing that, that, that we did. An example here is like, assume that I have uh, this is the Django admin. Assume that I have customers, and Taylor Swift is my customer, as well as Phil Collins and Caetan Veloso, that is a Brazilian singer. And I want to share this data with someone, and I don't want to reveal the privacy of my, of my customers. So what we did, we have a user model on our project, pretty much the same as I showed you before, and we build a uh, anonymizer uh, class that will deal with all the anonymization of the user model. We're using a library here to, to just make things uh, easy. So we define a class that is user anonym. Uh, oops, we're okay. And we just define how we want to anonymize the fields, like email and username, first name, last name, and all these things. And we are using like a fake library to just generate fake data. And we just register it, and then we run. This is a video, but I don't think it will run. Just show you the screenshot. Uh, we just run a comment, like regular comments in Django, and it just anonymizes all our user model in a very quick manner. But we just have five users, and we, are, we no longer have Taylor Swift, and no longer have Phil Collins. We have just random generated people. But you can see that I did this with five users. So imagine if I have a thousand, and I did this with one model. Imagine if I have a thousand. So this is a problem that uh, does not scale well. So it's good because it keeps the data structure, but it's bad because it can take too long to run a right and correct anonymization. And that was a problem that we faced, and we just. Take too, took too long to run an anonymization process. 
Uh, another thing that I want you to that I want to point to you is that anonymization must be precisely defined. So you saw that I precisely define what I want to anonymize in the user model. So if in the future, uh, if, I, if I forgot to anonymize something, I can have a privacy breach. Or if in the future someone sees, uh, someone has some background knowledge about my data set, this person might just look through my data set and infer something about my users. And that's why this static method is often only pseudo anonymization, not real anonymization. You have to be like careful when you're dealing with that. A second method that tries to solve this is k-anonymity. And before going to the definition, I want to just share our example. Uh, I think in the 90s, the US Census made the research and they wanted to just uh, figure out what was the demographic pattern of the US citizens. So they find out that for the necessary for you to uniquely identify a person, you just need to know three unique attributes of a person. There was zip code, date of birth, and gender. So if you just know these three things, you are able to uniquely identify a person in the US Census database. And these attributes, that they are not personal information, they are just attributes. They, but when they are used together, they can be used to uniquely identify persons. These attributes are named quasi-identifiers. The main idea of k-anonymity is to just create groups with these quasi-identifiers. So you're gonna put people in these groups and you'll not be able to uniquely just point to this person. And it does that by using generalization and suppression. Let's see how this works in practice, okay? Uh, suppose that I have a person and I have information about this person and this person is single and this person is 20 years old. Just by looking through the table here, I can say that Jill is the one I'm looking for. Jill committed a theft. And Jill, and Canonimity wants to just solve this problem. Just by knowing this information, I don't wanna be able to identify that person. Assume, so, we're gonna partition the domain of space into several regions in order to put persons into groups. Assume that I have my data set as the space search here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna separate these persons into groups. So I'm gonna just group together people that are separate and single into one group. And I'll do a cut in my database. So I'm gonna do another cut and I'm gonna separate people by age now. So I'm gonna put together people who are younger. And I did another cut in my database. And I have a resulting table and if I look, I just don't, I can't just say uh, what is the person that I'm looking for. If I have a single and if I have, uh, if I know that a person is 20 years old. But we have a problem here uh, and the problem is I know what types of crime the person may have committed. So the problem is I protect people against identity disclosure but I don't protect them against attribute disclosure. And another thing about canonymity is that if you like uh, doing multiple release, you need to coordinate this release to make sure that you are not releasing one data in one data set and you're not releasing other type of data in another data set. And background knowledge attack is still a risk. And that's why there's a few refinements to this technique. So they all search for ways to change the variability of the sensitive attributes to assure privacy. And we have a few use cases uh, of this technique. Uh, the have I, have I Been Pound solution use k-anonymity to just uh, break your password into chunks and then send the chunks to the server so the server doesn't know your full password. You just search for separately. And also Octopus Protect and maybe your project. If you do something, please tag me. I would love to know. Nice. Privacy is also very important. Let's see another technique. Uh, another technique about showing privacy is differential privacy. And 
This is like the golden standard of privacy in the theory of the theoretical field. And this is a type of dynamic anonymization. And the main idea is to preserve privacy when doing data analysis. And the interesting thing here is that this is not an algorithm. This is a definition. This is a formal definition. And the main goal, no, not the goal, but the main idea is that you can learn about a database and you can learn all about the information there, all the correlations, without learning about the individuals on the database. So the privacy of your individuals are protected. And that's just very interesting. Let's see how this works. Uh, let's assume that I have an analyst, and this analyst is doing queries to two data sets. Uh, da uh, database one is, no, database two is equal to database one plus my data. And uh, differential privacy states that the results of these both queries, they must be just pretty much the same. So the database should have the same distribution. And this is so good because uh, an attacker, he will not be able to tell if he's doing queries on, with my data or without my data. So if he doesn't know how he will get inf personal information about me, since he doesn't know uh, in which data set he's doing queries. And this gives you a plausible deniability if an individual is or isn't in a data set. Uh, here we have a formula that is pretty much exactly what I say here. Uh, since I, have, I came from an engineering background, I do not know if I'm explaining uh, the formula very well, so I'm going to try. And if I do not explain very well, you please just stop me someplace that I will continue to try to explain. But Pretty much we have a PR that is supposed as subset one, and we have PR plus delta that is a subset two. And then we have a mechanism that is a, is a randomized mechanism that gives you a different epsilon differential privacy for all the data sets. And this epsilon is e raised to the epsilon power, so it's a very small number, and assures that the difference between the data sets are very small, so the distribution of both data sets is pretty much the same. And this is very interesting because we, can have, we have a privacy loss measure, so we can measure uh, how, a pri how private or queries are being made. So we have a privacy budget and we can tune the amount of privacy. Uh, let's assume that I have a privacy budget of 0.1, and if I do one query with uh, epsilon value of 0.1, I would just take all the privacy and I'll not be able to do more queries because if I do more, the privacy of my customers will be compromised. So I can do small queries with small values of epsilon and this will just uh, increase to my privacy budget until we reach the limit. And there's a few challenges to this technique. And the first one is usability for now experts. So if you don't know how this works, if you don't know the math, it's a little difficult for you to just use it. Another problem, uh, challenge actually, is that it's difficult for you to provide support for all the queries that we do today with SQL. So uh, differential privacy works with a few mechanisms and all of them are mathematical methods. So it's very difficult for you to just match this with your like regular queries. Another challenge is that you need to integrate this with your environments. And if you have two data sets, this must be like twice as hard. Uh, you don't have much real world examples, and I'm gonna show you some examples, but you're gonna see why I'm saying that we don't have much. And it's still bound by the fundamental law of information recovery. And what does this law say? It says that if you do lots, lots of accurate queries on a data set, uh, with time you just have all the private information that you are trying to hide. So you need, this is tightly related with the privacy budget that we talked before. And we have a few good things about it, that is it protects us against arbitrary risk. So if in the future uh, some person just got some data, uh, important data about my customer, you'll not be able to just link 
my data with this new data because the mechanism of differential privacy protects us against this. And another thing is that we can quantify privacy loss, so we can know exactly how privacy loss works, and you can know how this works in, in a bigger scale. Uh, there's promising applications on machine learning and to assure privacy when, doing, uh, when dealing with machine learning projects and is used by a lot of big companies. And now I'm gonna show you some examples that are real nice. For example, uh, the most used emoji, this, uh, I think by Apple, was made using differential privacy. So they use a technique to just know what types of emojis do you just type to your friends and to know which was the most used without uh, hurting your privacy, without knowing specific who you are while doing. But uh, some research say they were not doing very well. So, yeah, let's continue. Uh, we also have a Uber project about doing queries with privacy when you're doing queries to a data set. And it's like two years ago, the last commit, so it's not very much uh, updated. And there's also people that say that it's not French or private, that there's a few problems. Uh, and we have a new one that is from Google that is quite recent, and I am totally recommend everyone to check. Uh, they have a Postgres extension. I think they, will, they went like beyond everyone else because they just give us tools to use it. So I didn't see anyone yet just uh, comment or saying that it's wrong or if it's right, but in the future I think some people will write some reviews. And there's a nice article that goes with it. I totally recommend, it's real nice. Uh, and now, you know, just knowing through these things, it doesn't mean that we have privacy, but it means that we are in the right way to do, uh, to generate privacy, to do queries with privacy and protect your users while doing it. Uh, to end, I would like to leave you with a few concerns when anonymizing data sets. And the first one is that data cannot be fully anonymized and remain useful. There is a trade-off between privacy and usefulness. So you must like define how much useful do you want your data to be and how much privacy do you want your data to be. Uh, Reidentification is not the only risk. The risk is what people can do with the data that they find. So assume that you have a pet shop. I don't think that a lake on a pet shop will be like so critical, but you mean if a leak on NSA is like very critical. Uh, queries over large data set are not protective, as I told you uh, about the fundamental law of information recovery. If you do lo lots of queries, you get uh, uh, information. Uh, query audit is problematic. It's very hard to audit uh, queries, especially when there are many. Uh, Summary statistics are not safe because you can just trick the questions in order to get private uh, answers. And revealing ordinary facts may be problematic, so if you just follow ordinary facts through time, if something changes on this fact, you just can uh, infer a lot from the person. And the last one is computer security is not privacy protection, so if at some point, you may have all encrypted and stored and in the best way, but someone from the inside may just leak your information. So you have to think about all the possible steps. And that's it. We have reference here, and here's the link of the slides. Thank you.